uh, which is a software company in Brisbane. And today I'll be talking about end-to-end -end testing in Node.js and trying to share some sort of good information about approaches um, in a sort of ever, uh, a, a sort of confusing sort of environment to work. So a little bit about me before I start. Uh, I do write a blog called watermelon.blog. Uh, so I write that about like test, software testing, automated testing, different techniques. Um, I have a, a Twitter account which basically just reflects the blog. Importantly, I actually set up a, um, that I'll be giving sort of like demos of four different uh, very sort of popular common Node.js end-to-end frameworks and tools today. And I set up working demonstrations of each of those tools under my GitHub profile. So you can actually go away today and actually have a look at those four working demos. You can clone them, check them out, and actually be able to run them and actually get started straight away without having to do a lot of the sort of like initial setup. So I'll have that link at the very end as well, but um, it's something that you can check out. As for the picture, when I'm not at work, um, I like doing a lot of exploring, um, a lot of outdoor stuff, um, hiking. This is a mountain called Mount Beerwa, which is in the Glasshouse Mountains in uh, Queensland, southeast Queensland. Um, this is the top of that mountain. It's one of my favorite places. Um, it's very fun to go to. Um, it's very challenging to get to the top of it, but it definitely is a great place and very beautiful. You can see a lot of the other glass house mountains in the distance as well. So, I guess the question about <laughs> this call and why I wanted to talk about Node.js today, and I'll start with a little story. In, in 2015, I actually applied to work at a company called Automatic, uh, which uh, has a product called WordPress.com. And as part of working at that company, as part of being hired at that company, everyone works as a, uh, works on the paid trial. So it's the, the company is a globally distributed, rem, re, all remote company, so everyone works from anywhere in the world. Uh, and the way to get a job at that company is you send in an application, and, they, and if your application looks good, they say to you, hey, here's a real piece of work that you can work on and you'll have a couple of months to work on that. You work on it in your own time, you don't quit your current job. And if we're happy with what you do, you'll have a job at the end. Uh, and the, the, they make the trial projects sufficiently sort of vague and nebulous that you really need to show a lot of like initiative because that's what you need in that company because you don't get a lot of direction. So my, my project was basically to implement an end-to-end -end automated test for WordPress.com. So the product had been around for 10 years um, but they'd never actually had a single end-to-end -end test written against the product. So, so yeah, my challenge was, hey, set something up to run against this. So what I did was, as Scott mentioned, I was involved with the water project at the time, which is a Ruby-based project. And so what I did was I quickly, within like a week or two, I like churned out these like water cucumber end-to-end uh, -end tests for WordPress.com. And it was super easy, and I was like, oh, confident, this is awesome, this is great. And I, and I said, hey, this is what I've done. And then, the response was very like lukewarm at best. So it was like, wait a second, we've got like over 100 devs and not a single dev writes Ruby. And I don't think this is really going to work in our company that where everyone works around the world and like who's going to work on this and who's going to maintain it, you can't just do this. So I thought, okay, let's, it's good. I've got early feedback. I can sort of like quickly iterate and I said, well, I had a look at what was happening in the company. So WordPress is tr traditionally a PHP product um, but they were all in, at the time, they were moving towards having JavaScript, full stack JavaScript, so Node.js, JavaScript, React, front end. Um, the company like basically said, we're all in on JavaScript, everyone's going to learn JavaScript, everyone's going to do JavaScript. So I said, well, the obvious thing for me to do is to do end-to-end -to -end tests in, in Node.js in JavaScript. Um, unfortunately, I'd never used Node before, I'd never used JavaScript before. And so I used that trial period to basically teach myself Node, teach myself JavaScript, and actually implement these tests for a platform I hadn't um, automated against before. And then I was successful in the trial in, by implementing this framework, which is still used today, three and a half, four years later. And at the time, the thing that I found um, with Node.js, and coming from a background in Ruby, and I've written tests in Python, and C Sharp, and Java, 
is that it was really, really super complicated in 2015. Definitely, it was like crazy complicated. It was really, really hard to understand and to get things working. Um, 2019, fast forward to earlier this year, I decided to finish Automatic because I couldn't um, do the travel, um, having too much of an impact on my life, um, my family life. And I decided to look around Brisbane for a job that was going to be working in the office again. And interestingly, when I started looking at Seek, that just about every second job or every job uh, around the test automation space mentioned Node.js and mentioned all these different tools on, in JavaScript. And I was like, oh my god, like it's become like this crazy popular thing. So it's something that in 2019, I think it's a skill that test automation engineer really needs to understand Node, needs to understand JavaScript. So my talk today is really about trying to share some of the information I've learned over the last four years of, of using Node and try and sort of like create some clarity in a confusing in landscape. So why is that? I mentioned that it's hard. Why is it so hard? Like why is it harder than Ruby or, or Java? The, I think the, the first sort of key thing is that Node.js is an asynchronous language. JavaScript is asynchronous. So asynchronous means that things don't necessarily execute in a specific order. So an asynchronous conversation would be like if you text someone, that's asynchronous because you're not, you don't have that person there and you're not getting a response from them straight away. They might, you might text someone, they might be asleep and they text you back tomorrow morning. You can't be of a short of a response. A synchronous conversation is if you're on the phone talking to someone, you can be saying, I can ask you a question, they respond, I can ask you a question, they respond. So Node.js is asynchronous, so you never really know that something's going to actually complete. It's going to just go out and do something. And as we design and write end-to-end -end tests, they're typically a series of synchronous steps. So typically say, hey, I want to like find a field that's a logon field, and then I want to enter a value into that logon field, and then I want to find a password field, enter a password field, and find a logon button, click that, and make sure that they get a message. So that's a series of steps. And if you can't find the login field, you can't enter a password and you can't log on. So that's typically a series of synchronous steps. Also, um, with Node.js, and as I'll go through the examples today, there are a lot of like inconsistent approaches. Like it's um, fairly new, sort of like it has been around for a number of years now, but there's still a lot of like different approaches. So if you Google something, you'll find something for a couple of years ago that'll be entirely different to what it is today. And following from on that, there's lots of different flavors of JavaScript. And there's these things, um, so you'll hear JavaScript, you'll hear a thing called ECMA script, or known as ES. You'll hear about TypeScript, you'll hear about vanilla JS, common JS, all these different ways of doing similar things, but in different, slightly different um, languages and implementations. I'll go into that in a bit more detail as well. Confusingly, there's um, this ECMA script thing, they changed the naming of it halfway through, so there was ES6 and then they renamed that to be ECMA script 2015, ES7 became ECMA script 2016, and then if you refer, to, if you hear, hear a term called ES next, it means it's like the next generation of um, ES features. And each of these has features that you can't necessarily use in the previous version, so it can become quite confusing. And finally, the tools in this space are settling a little bit now in 2019, but there's still there's still a lot of tools that do very similar things. So there's NPM, which is a sort of standard approach to um, managing dependencies and tasks. But then Facebook decided that, hey, that wasn't good enough. Let's go and create our own. So they created Yarn. So a lot of projects use Yarn, but then NPM sort of caught up to Yarn. And so there's lots of tools that are like, do the same thing, but different places do different things. Mocha and Jest is the same. They're test frameworks, and, and Mocha does certain things. And then they said, hey, we'll do Jest. And then there's lots of different tools that do very similar things. So from someone starting out, it's very confusing because you're like, oh, what do I use? NPM or Yarn, do I use multiple address? So I'll try and clarify some of that and talk today. Also, another thing that makes it particularly hard is how many tools there are. And I've got some slides to 
show, like just end-to-end -end testing in Node, like just how many tools that we have. If you search for on npm, if you search for Selenium, you get all these different libraries, like, and some of them don't even have anything really to do with Selenium or anything to do with like official Selenium stuff, like Selenium Chrome, Clearcation. So people created all these little npm libraries, and some of them have like may have existed years ago and don't even work and aren't maintained. And even if you search for WebDriver, you get these different. You don't actually get the official web driver um, results, uh, like the official library, but then you get all these different libraries that may or may not do what you want to do. So it's very like confusing sort of landscape to actually like start out in. As I mentioned, I'll try and clarify the ES for the ECMA script thing. So ECMA script is actually a standard, so it's a, a standard that has uh, certain features and, and things that should be available. And JavaScript is actually an implementation of that standard. It's by far the most um, known and well-used implementation of ECMS script in the world. It pretty much runs on every computer, every browser, and every device around. A version of it, a version of that standard. So ES5 was uh, a version that was created in 2009. And then um, that's probably the most compatible version if uh, if you were looking at a browser. And then in in a huge gap between 2009 and 2015, they bought out um, ES2015, which they called ES6 at the time. And then they added things to JavaScript that previously weren't there. So things that have been in other languages from the start, like Java, like classes and modules. Two, two years forward, they then brought out a thing which is really important, which I'll talk about today as well, which is the async await support. So it, it's a way that allows you to write tests in a, in a synchronous way, which I'll explain in more detail. <coughs> Importantly, uh, because these ES features aren't necessarily backwards compatible with previous versions of JavaScript, and there are a lot of like different JavaScript clients, and there are even um, no versions that support different ES features, it's important that um, you use a tool that can, what they call transpile, which is basically change the code so it's backwards compatible, actually make it so it looks like the old version of the code. And you can use those fairly easily and very quickly. So there's a tool called Babel that you can use. So when you actually execute code, you call Babel, it'll transpile that code back to an older version of JavaScript and actually execute it like it is. And you use that as well to, um, and Webpack to actually be able to do this for browser-based applications as well. I'd like to explain a little bit more detail about the synchronous and asynchronous thing. So with the example I gave, end-to-end -end tests are typically a series of synchronous step. So in our example, we want to find a username field. And once we've found that username field, we can say, yep, we've found it. We want to enter our username. We want to find the password field. And then we want to say, yep, we've found it. We'll enter our password. We'll find a login button. Yep, we've found it. Let's click it. Yes, we've clicked it. Now we can see welcome display. We can actually query that back in the browser. If we're trying to run that in an asynchronous way, Basically, each one of those commands, like find username, build, enter username, enter password, will basically just fire off at the same time. So it'll asynchronously fire off, and then they'll just go out. And then at some point, the browser will come back and say, hey, I've done that. But because we haven't made sure that the first thing that we wanted to do has happened before we've fired off and got the result for the second, it just basically ensures chaos. Like it just all will just go and do crazy things, and you have no idea what's going on. You don't know which one's executing in what order. So, if you're trying to write tests and you weren't thinking about then running them synchronously, you'll just get complete chaos. Which is what I started to do when I first um, implementing these tests for WordPress. I was like, why is this not working? Everything was just exploding. So. That's sort of like the idea, and I'll talk about the solutions in nodes that you can actually overcome this. 
So, as I said, it defaults to asynchronous, and the ways that tools um, in Node overcome these challenges is that a lot of them have an inbuilt control flow mechanism. So, the tool itself that's actually executing the test, it will handle it for you. So, you don't have to do any work. You can actually just write the test like you would in a synchronous way, and it will use inbuilt mechanisms to do that. Interestingly, some of the tools started out supporting this approach of having a control flow mechanism and then they decided it was actually too hard to maintain. It's very complex to actually maintain this way of um, executing tests. And then they decided to, de to deprecate that functionality. So WebDriver.js, which is the um, official Selenium bindings, no longer support the control flow mechanism. They originally did have that, which we used, and then they got rid of it, so we had to switch away from it. Some other tools, I'll give some examples as I go along. Um, I would use chaining, so chaining methods together so that a method will only call after another. Others use callbacks to say, uh, call this thing, but then when you're done, return a function so that then you can check what happened. And then others use a thing called promises, which is basically a way to say, execute this thing, wait for a promise to be fulfilled. When a promise is fulfilled, I can say, this thing's done, and then I can continue along. So I'll talk again a little bit about that, how that works. Control flow management. As I mentioned, there's a tool called Cypress, which I'll talk in more detail about. It controls the execution order for you. So this is some example Cypress commands. So we've got three different commands. We visit a page, we get a link, we click it, and then we check to make sure that there's some text. Whilst there's nothing there to indicate that uh, the second line depends on the first line or the third line depends on the second line, Cypress does some magic behind the scenes to make sure that those are executed in the right way for you. And this is the way that WebDriver.js used to work, but then it now doesn't work, you have to do different things. So that's one approach. This is a tool called Nightwatch.js, and this is an example that's directly from their website, from their homepage. And it's called Chaining. So what happens here is that each of these calls is, there's no semicolon, there's, these aren't individual calls, they're basically chained chain together. So the client has a dot URL, and then after the dot URL it says dot wait for element, dot assert, dot visible, dot set value. So these are basically calling like all these different functions, one after the other, but chained together. The, the um, downsides to this approach, and I'm personally not a fan of this approach, is it can be really hard to read because it's um, everything's chained together and you can't really see uh, like which like where the chain starts and ends and it's hard to read. But also it's hard to debug because if something happens sort of like somewhere in the middle, it's very hard like with your call stack and to be able to see like an error, you might not be able to exactly work out at what point in the chain failed. Um, so I'm not as keen on that, and it's probably you probably won't see it as much. I think Nightwatch is probably the only one that really encourages it. Puppeteer uh, is a I'll talk a bit more of details a Google project. Uh, it uses a thing called promises, so they're a way for asynchronous functions to complete without using callbacks. So in this example we've got a new page function off browser and then it has a it has a function that it's called then, which is a common um, function name for promises. And this is only called when that command is completed. So when we get the then function being executed, it will return an object in this case which is a page. And at that point we know that we have a page object and then we can continue with that. So once we have that page object, we can then go and do something with that page. In this case, we go to a URL. At that point, then, we have a promise which is returned to our then function, which we can then go and do something to that page, which is uh, wait for another element. So the then methods are a way uh, to, for promises to be able to say, hey, a promise is resolved. 
and we can continue on. So this is a sort of very common way to write um, synchronous tests in Node. But fortunately, in Node 8 Plus, they came out with an even better way to actually use promises. So these still use exactly the same sort of under the hood um, functionality of promises, but it just gives you a, a lot nicer way to actually um, write these. So um, we can highlight the, like if the, if we mark the function as asynchronous using the async keyword, it then allows us to use a command or a, a, a command called await. And await basically just says, I'm, I'm not going to continue execution order until we actually get the result from this command. So in our first line, we're saying we want to get a page, but we want to wait that the browser return the new page. So it'll wait for that promise to be fulfilled before it continues to the next line. Again, on our next line, we want to await the result of our go-to uh, function before we continue to the next line. And then we want to, in this case, we want to wait for the element to appear before we continue, and, and before we can finish that block. So, yeah. What, is the, um, what does that timeout uh, mean here? Like, I saw that you have been using this timeout five um, yeah. Use as well for a puppeteer. Yeah. So for puppeteer, it's the same. Override the timeout to be five. So wait for that element to appear within five seconds. So do you think that's a good idea to use a timeout? Because in timeout, we are not uh, making system to do anything for five thousand milliseconds. It's it's a maximum value. Yeah. Okay. So it'll only wait up to that amount. So do you yeah. think it's a good idea to use timeout? Um, in this case, in this case, the example that it's running against, which is in the GitHub repository, mm -hmm. um, I actually wrote a, I actually wrote that element to appear after three seconds. So if if I just said if I just wait for that element to appear, and I think I believe the default for Puppeteer is one second, okay. the test will fail every time because it appears after three seconds. Um, so it, it will only it will only wait for three seconds because as soon as it appears it will continue. But if you don't specify the five seconds in this example, it will fail because it, it's not it's not like a sleep. It's not like a, if I put a line here that says sleep for five seconds, I don't think that that would be a good approach. But in this case, it does wait for that to appear. So if you had an example of a system where you're trying to retrieve some external data and you know that it's not going to be instantaneous but you do want to wait for a certain amount of time, it's good to use that. You can also set a default value if this is just a simplified okay. example. Yep. As I mentioned, one aspect of the Node.js space that makes it super confusing is like just how many end-to-end -end testing tools there are. And I think there's probably more in Node.js than there are in even like more established libraries, like uh, programming languages like Java and Ruby and Python. Like it's amazing. Like this is these are just the ones that I know. Of. This wouldn't be an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, but there's uh, a crazy amount, and I imagine over time that this will settle down. I imagine a lot of these will like die out or merge together. But at the moment, if you wanted to, like, if you went end-to-end -end testing in Node in, Java, in Google, you'd probably like, <coughs> like a list like this, and then you'd be like, well, that's what I use. So I'll just run through this quickly, and then I'll talk in detail about more. So WebDriver.io is a, it isn't an official Selenium um, project, but it's an implementation of the WebDriver bindings. So WebDriver has its own protocol, and then WebDriver.io uses that protocol to actually automate browsers. There's a Selenium, official Selenium bindings, which are called, known as WebDriver.js. Puppeteer is another one I talked about, which is a Google Chrome or Chromium project that it actually automates Chrome and Chromium using the Chrome dev tool. So it doesn't actually use WebDriver, it just directly hooks into Chrome through its web tools. Test Cafe, Code Set JS, Nightwatch, which I showed before. Cypress, which is a very popular and increasingly popular framework, which I'll talk about. Casper.js, Protractor, which sort of sits up on top of um, WebDriver.js to actually um, focus around Angular testing. 
Tyco is a new ThoughtWorks tool, and that's about it from that point of view. I'll talk in detail about some of them. So Cypress. Cypress has been around for a couple of years. I think it started out as a um, as a beta, and I think it's generally released now. Um, there was a lot of hype when it first came out because it does a different approach to how it automates a browser. It's a very opinionated framework. If you have a look at the documentation, it says like you should do this way, you should do this, you shouldn't do this. It's very, very opinionated and it's very sort of like framework based. So it's very much like out of the box, you can get up and running very quickly. It's got a test runner. It's it does a lot of like value added things. So like when you're executing a test in Cypress, like it will automatically like fail the test if you get like a console error in the browser. Or it'll fail the test on if you get like any like um, HTTP errors. Uh, which can be good and bad. It can be good because like you don't have to write that stuff yourself. It can be bad that like if you're depending on an external library and it gets a console error, it can fail your test and you might not care. Um, depending on what you want to do. It also does things like if you get a JavaScript alert within your web page, um, they're typically known to be a pain to get rid of because they sort of like come out to the native system and they can block tests from executing. So it deals with the, those just by dismissing them completely. So you couldn't write a Cypress test to actually check for the existence of an alert because it just won't, it just won't let you touch them. It, won't, it just gets rid of them completely. As I mentioned previously, it handles all the asynchronous nature of JavaScript for you. So you don't actually have to use async or wait. You can just write code out directly like, like it shows there. It is very um, focused on Chrome and Chromium. That's the only browsers that it supports at present. And there's possible future support, but at the moment they're the only um, browsers. The reason that it's very different to every other tool that I'll mention is that the way that it works is it actually creates a proxy within the browser session and then it, it sort of directs all the traffic through that proxy. It doesn't actually automate the browser from the outside, it actually executes it from the inside, embeds the proxy. The reason that they like this approach is that they say it's fast and you can do lots of things. Um, the downside to this is it's got some really major limitations. So it doesn't support iframes. So the place where I work at the moment, we have um, we have things called micro apps. So we've got about 30 React micro apps within an Angular app. Um, so we have these micro apps that run, which are single page apps within our other single page app, and they're all they all sit within iframes. So Cypress won't work for us because it can't access anything within an iframe. It also can't anything, access anything across domains. So if you're testing something that uses a different domain, like you say, if you wanted to, you probably wouldn't want to, but as an example, if you wanted to test that you could actually open up a PayPal window, like if you had a PayPal payment, um, you couldn't do it in Cypress because it's not on, it only works on the domain that your tests run against. It also, um, the, the HTTPS support is pretty bad because it actually is using a proxy and it just gets all sorts of errors. So there's some very big limitations to it you need to look into if you're to starting out with it. Um, and also, it's not a completely free tool. It, you can get started for free, but if you want to do things like run tests in parallel, you basically have to subscribe and pay to use their test runner to run them in parallel. So it's not entirely open source and free. But it is very popular. You see a lot of job ads mentioning it and stuff like that. Puppeteer. So that's the next tool I'll talk about. This is a pretty promising tool. Um, I personally really like it. It's it's very lightweight. It just does one thing. I think it does it really well, which is automate Chrome. It's very supported by, um, it's it's part of the Chromium project, which is connected to Google Chrome. It's the way the open source part of the project that Chrome is based upon. Uh, on. And because of that, it's very, very fast. It's very up to date, and it's very extensive in terms of how you can automate the browser. 
the documentation is really good. Uh, it's but the obvious limitations of it is it's very focused on Chrome because it uses Chrome Dev Tools. It would pretty much never support another browser like, unless another browser decided to support Chrome Dev Tools, which they'd be crazy to. So it's pretty much locked into Chrome. Saying that um, with end-to-end -end tests, I've found that focusing on one browser in the past has been a really good way to focus on regression testing. As Trish said this morning, regression testing in, in something like Chrome is a good way to actually have end-to-end -end tests and then using exploratory testing to cover other browsers. That's the approach that I've taken, so that's why I don't mind something like Puppeteer. And the other downside to it, uh, especially if you're starting out, it's very lightweight. It does the automation of the browser very well, but all the other stuff you need to do, like a test runner, you can use whatever you like, but you need to come up with a test runner. You need to come up with, like, if you want to do some, um, like, a assertion library, you need to create use as a search and library or find one yourself. Like there's different um, things that you need. It's not, a, it's not out of the box. You can't just sort of like grab Puppeteer and then just have a, a full framework. That's the syntax. It's straightforward, as I mentioned. Um, it supports async away. So it's very easy to write tests in a very nice sort of way. There's a lot of Docker online about it. WebDriver.io. Um, <coughs> This is probably one of my least favorites, but it is popular. I'm not sure whether it's decreasingly popular. Um, it's very opinionated, so again, it's very much out of the box. You can get up and running fairly quickly, but it allows you, its downside to me is that it allows you to do basically everything and anything. So it supports every type of Selenium server. It supports Gecko driver, Chrome driver. It can support all the remote um, browser execution services. It can even run against mobile apps. It can has all these concept of add-ons. It's got lots of dis dependencies, like you need to have a JDK installed to be able to use it, even though it's not with Node library. It's so it's very heavy. Um, it's, it's sort of opposite to Puppeteer, and it's very heavy, and it's got a lot of dependencies. And interestingly, um, I was working at Domino's and they were using um, version 4 of WebDriver.io and then they tried to upgrade, upgrade to version 5 and everything blew up because you had a look at the change log and they basically like changed like every like every name of every API call they changed and just said, hey, there's version 5 and it was just like had to rewrite an entire test suite, um, which was crazy. I thought there's virtual to do. Um, but it does it does handle the async stuff as well. So it's similar to, to Cypress in that it will execute um, commands one after the other. And finally, the, the last framework that I'll talk about is WebDriver.js. So this was the one that we used at Automatic and WordPress.com. And um, at the time, it was probably Cypress didn't exist. Uh, Puppeteer definitely didn't exist. Uh, WebDriver.io, I think, may have existed. Um, this is, yeah, these are the official Selenium bindings. So this is officially maintained by the Selenium project. They originally started out having that control flow mechanism, so being able to write, write your tests without having to worry about async, um, the asynchronous nature of JavaScript. They did get rid of that, and it was a bit of a pain for us at Automatic to actually have to rewrite our tests to then use the um, promises, but we did do it, and it did work fairly easily. And so, yeah, so it's very similar to Puppeteer in that you use async away in Node.js 8 plus, and then you can call different commands. You can know that they execute in order. Um, because it's Selenium, it will support any of the Selenium browsers, so Firefox and Chrome and Safari, I think, even works, and it does support things like source items and stuff like that as well. Um, it's, it's probably not as popular as some of the other projects. I'm not too sure why, um, but it is fully featured and it does do a lot of things. So I ran through a lot of those tools, and 
I guess the question, like, if you're trying to decide, like, if you wanted to go and, like, start to write end-to-end -end tests in Node.js, <coughs> the question would be, like, how, like, how do you start? There's so many different things. So I sort of came up with two different ways to visualize this. Um, the four tools that I talked about, two of them have a cross-browser support. So cross-browser support is, like, really important to you if you really need to run tests in different browsers. Um, WebDriver.js and WebDriver.io are, are the tools that support that. Because they support WebDriver protocol, they are the tools that really allow you to, to run those tests in different browsers. So they're the ones to look at. If you don't care about cross-browser stuff, if you're happy just to use Chrome, Cypress and Puppeteer are the tools that you could use because they'll just support Chrome. And then the other sort of element is about whether or not you want an opinionated sort of all-in-one out-of-the-box type framework or whether you want something that's more lightweight and that's more um, less opinionated and allows you to have more control. So if you wanted um, an opinionated framework, Cypress and WebDriver IO are definitely very opinionated and very much out-of-the-box. You can do all this different stuff. If you want a less opinionated framework where it allows you a lot more control and a lot more customization, WebDriver.js and Puppeteer are libraries that are more lightweight and focused on the one particular thing. And I turn that into a chart that says, correct, choose your own node adventure. So you just need to answer two questions. And so the question is, like, do you want an all-in-one framework, or do you actually want, like, want to get your hands dirty and actually build something yourself? So if you want to build something yourself, if you want to get your hands dirty and actually like choose a test runner, choose an assertion library, choose these different things. Um, if you require multi-browser support, WebDriver.js is a good choice. Excuse me. And if you don't. Puppeteer would be a good choice because it is purely focused on Chrome and it gives you a nice, easy library to interact with. If you do want the out-of-the-box, all-in-one solution, it really comes down to whether you want multi-browser or iframe support. Um, as I mentioned, Cypress doesn't support iframe, so that's one element that you really need to consider. And or cross-domain as well. So, but if you want multi-browser support, WebDriver.io is <coughs> something to look at. And if you don't need that, or you don't need iframe support, Cypress is something that you can have a look at. I'll finish with some suggestions to make your life a little bit easier if you're starting out, or using Node.js. So, NVM is a tool that you can use to actually manage node versions. So it, uh, as you're working on a project, as I mentioned, features are only available in certain node versions, like node async awaits only node 8 plus. So NVM allows you to actually put a file in your project so anyone working on that will automatically get that version of node that you're using. Um, ESLint is a way to actually say, this is the way that the code should be formatted, and it's particularly important for JavaScript because it's not um, strongly typed. It's people can write crazy different things. So ESLint allows you to specify some rules, and Prettier is a tool that works with that to actually say when you save or when you commit um, code, it will actually completely reformat that code to obey those rules. And when I first started using Prettier, I was a little bit like oh my god, this is weird because I've written this code and then all of a sudden I've saved it or committed it and it's gone and changed how it looks. And I was like, how dare it? But as you start using it, you just get used to it and you get the benefit of it is that all, you know, you can be confident that when you open up the code, it's going to look the same no matter who writes it. So it's really good. Um, MPM is good as a tool to manage both dependencies and also a task runner. Um, there's a task runner called Grunt which is used a bit, but... I've found that NPM can actually do pretty much everything or probably as much as Grunt, so it's definitely caught up in terms of what you can do. So if you're using mono repo, so if you have lots of different um, node projects within the one Git or source control repo, there's a tool called Mono which you can use. Um, 
and using NPM learners should as Yarn, in my opinion. And if you're going to actually um, write this test, as I mentioned, I'd really recommend to use async await if you're going to be using um, promises, a library that supports it. Otherwise, if a library um, has their own inbuilt ones, easy enough to use that. I'd avoid the chaining and callbacks because that can make your code pretty hard to understand and to debug. And importantly, I recommend that you check the quickly whether how compatible and easy to use this uh, with your um, continuous integration or continuous deployment system. So I know that in setting up the examples on GitHub, WebDriver, because they all run on a CI platform, um, which is linked to the repositories, I know that WebDriver IO was really, really hard to get running in the CI platform because it had so many dependencies. Um, whereas the other ones basically just work, because I just basic node libraries they just work. So it's something that you should take into account that when when you're looking at like a tool to say, hey, can we get something like a single test? Can we write it? Can we get it into like a CI platform and can it like work easily without having to spend a crazy amount of time on it? And importantly, like as Trish mentioned this morning with the testing pyramid. <coughs> Um, with these end-to-end -end tests, like I'm a big advocate for them, but I'm also an advocate for making sure that you're covering breadth, and not depth. So not writing a crazy number of tests that do detailed negative <coughs> tests and validations and all these different things. It's really about giving you confidence that your system works as an entire thing, um, not work, not trying to test that every individual component or unit works. Um, so because they can be overused. <laughs> and if it's all too hard, <laughs> just put hands up and say, hey, use Ruby. Um, <laughs> so that's about it. I covered a lot of information. I'll put these slides on my blog, most likely today. As I mentioned, the important thing that um, to check out is the GitHub because each of those four tools I've talked about today, Cypress, Puppeteer, WebDriver, IO, WebDriver, Jazz, I've got working demos of each. They're quite simple, but they're working. They run in continuous integration, Surface so CI, for each of them. Um, so you can have a look at them. You can understand how they work and, um, and coin them, play around with them. It gives you something to get started with without having to like go and Google and try and just get caught up in this whole crazy ecosystem of Node and then go from there. So start simple and move on. Thank you. I'm not sure if I have time for one question. <laughs> yeah, it's like 10.45, so I'm like right on time. Yep. Um, so so this one is mainly for the front end to try yep. understand correctly. Yep. So what about because uh, at, even now, so for some our team, um, so our team is mainly focused on the front end. Well, another uh, another naval team, uh, sibling team, um, they mainly focus on the back end. Yep. They also use Node.js, but this this kind of like a BFF, the back end for front end layer. Yep. So any other like suggestion or recommendation um, from your perspective can just kind of use what kind of tool. So it's also good for that one. Yeah. Because that one also just mainly, I think majority of them are just for the um, like the API core, just the yeah. rest for API calls, so not yeah. like UI stuff. Um, yeah, I think API tests are pretty easy to write in Node. Like it depends. Like you can use the same. Because earlier we are using like 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 um, Cucumber. Um, yeah, Java based but yeah. version. So, I think you can. Yeah. So there's two parts. I guess there's the test framework part, mm -hmm. which is like the way that, like the sorry, the, the like the test runner that allows you to specify them. Mm -hmm. So like Mocha, Jest, <coughs> Jasmine. That just allows you to actually like express the test or Cucumber. Um, that just allows you to express the test. But how you actually execute the test, if you're an API test, it would depend on what like which way your system calls APIs might be like super agent or a different node library that executes them. Um, so um, I'd recommend, yeah, like you can basically choose whichever one you want. Um, I don't think there's one particular one, but for like React um, unit and component testing, there's different ways 
jest is a very common approach and it's got these things called snapshots which allows you to render out React components and actually store a snapshot of those and run those and compare it against each of those. So we use those to actually verify that the React components are working um, purely from a React, like from a rendering point of view. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different tools and it really depends on what, like your Node.js system would call APIs using a library and I've just used that and then wrap it with, with whatever test framework you want to use. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can just ask him offline. Yeah. Yep. You want a question? Hey, uh, given that somebody already have a lot of mission framework up and running in Selenium and Java, so what would be the main driving force to actually you know, think about shifting from the traditional to the JavaScript framework? That means, uh, yeah. So the yeah the question was about moving from a traditional like Java based one to yeah, yeah. um I wouldn't do it unless you absolutely have to like I, I don't believe yeah. in just doing it just because it just for tool sake um I guess if your like organisation has that like if you're uh, moving towards having like full stack Node.js, JS um I think it would make sense because um uh, your you can work collaboratively to actually work with developers to actually work in the same sort of languages and frameworks to actually do it. Um, but I don't see that running your tests in like Node.js isn't going to give you any benefits more, like technically it's not going to give you any benefits more than you currently have in Java. Um,